Hey, good morning, Abundant Life. Happy Sunday. I'm Rashid. And my name is Tanisha. And whether you're watching us online or one of our campuses, we're so glad to have you with us this morning. Hey, check us out on social media. We also post several times throughout the week, some sermon highlights, worship clips, a lot of great things for you to stay connected with us. Give us a follow at Abundant Life LS at Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And check out our podcast called The Watching World. You can find it on any app that you will listen to podcasts. There are new episodes released every Thursday. For more information, go to livingproof.co slash podcast. Revival Weekend is coming up. All campuses coming together for one great weekend where you can discover freedom and forgiveness. Online, Blue Springs, Independence, Lee Summit. All of us together in one space. The fun starts on Friday, August 19th with worship and a message from Pastor Phil. Then Saturday is the Family Fun Fest with food trucks, live music, games, baptisms, and so much more. And finally, on Sunday, not one, but two services, one in the morning and one at night. Listen, Revival Weekend is going to be amazing. We want to see you there. So make sure to head on over to livingproof.co slash revival for more information and to register. Tuesday nights at the Lee Summit Campus is where it is at. Young adults from all over the city are coming together, learning God's truth, being challenged in their faith, and answering hard questions. If you are a young adult, join Paradigm on Tuesday nights at the Lee Summit Campus. Come and see what it's all about. Thank you again for joining us this morning. Today we're going to continue in the book of Daniel, so let's prepare our hearts for a time of worship. See ya. I'm so glad you're here. Hebrews 11:6 6 says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so would you join me this morning coming before our God full of faith that he can do impossible things, that he can move mountains and make a way where there's no way. We're going to lift up a song of faith to him this morning, that he is who he says he is. So sing along with us. We worship you, Father. It's 
God who does miracles. He does the impossible. Amen. You believe that this morning? We're going to sing a new song today. We want to teach you that our team actually wrote that just gives a declaration to that idea that God, you are still who you say you are and who you've always been. And I'll choose to believe. And I pray that you would help my unbelief. And when I doubt, when I struggle, would you help me to put my faith, my hope, my trust in you? So as you catch this song, sing along with us. And let it bring you to a place of response that we would surrender all to him as we trust in him and see him for who he is. We worship you, God. We come before you now. Coming to you now, humbly searching, and laying down the doubt and every burden. Would you show me what it looks like to be faithful when the answer hasn't come? What it looks like to surrender when the storm is raging on? Would you help my unbelief? Cause you are still God. Your 
We all have those moments like that, don't we? That, that we believe, God, you're good and that you are still God. And, and I believe, but, but God help my unbelief. It reminds me of the story in Mark where the, the man brings his son to Jesus and he's possessed by a demon and his response in, that Jesus can heal him was, I believe, but help my unbelief. 
So today, as we worship, we need a revival in this country. That is something we all should clap for. That's something we should all celebrate, that we need this. We need this in the body of Christ. And this weekend's 4th of July, the, it's the, the celebration of a free country that we can come into this place and worship freely. The God of creation, the God of all creation. And yet I still find myself saying sometimes, God, I believe, but help my unbelief. But I believe you're good, and I believe that you're God. So I want to open this altar to you for us to come together and pray for revival, to pray for our nation, to pray for the things that are, are burdening us, that are, that, are, that are wrestling against a holy God, that we would see a work that we cannot explain that is only because of God. So I want to invite our prayer, prayer ministry down here to the front, and I want to invite you to just join us down here at the altar. As we petition for our country, as we petition for the God of all creation, that he would revive us, that it would start with us. We, were, we heard this last week from Pastor Chad, that there's a circle, and may revival start with us in the center of this circle. So let's just spend some time here in prayer for our nation. God would start something in us. I'm just going to kneel, and I just invite you to join me as we worship and as we sing and as we pray and as we petition God. We thank you.
I pray this morning that you would take your place, that you would change us, that you would create a pure heart in us and a steadfast spirit. And may you begin something in our country, in us, in this place that would just go out and would change our country, our cities. That you would be glorified, that you would be the one that would be honored that your gospel would find broken people and restore them as they find you and place their hope in Jesus. God, we love you. We worship you this morning. Start in us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, we're so thankful that you're here today, that you're worshiping. I pray that that would be true of you, that you would believe that he would help your unbelief. Why don't you shake somebody's hand this morning? Just welcome them here to this place as we continue. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Life. My name is Peyton. I get to serve on staff here as our student outreach coordinator. And we're just so thankful that y'all have joined us for church. When you drove in this morning, you might've noticed some flags outlining the street. And those are there because we just wanna celebrate Independence Day weekend and celebrate the freedoms that we have here in the States and thank those of y'all who may have served our country in any way. And so, yeah, if you've served our country or you're a family member, yeah, thank y'all so much. Seriously. Hey, and some of y'all have joined us for church for the first time at Abundant Life. And if that's the case, welcome. There's a card in the seat back in front of you and that same card at livingproof.co slash next steps. Those cards are a great way for us to know that you're here and then to be sure to connect with you. And so if you would fill out that card and then take it to the next steps desk in the lobby, there's some really awesome people out there that just wanna give you a gift to say thank you for joining us for church. And if you're watching live through our online campus right now, go ahead and let us know in the chat that you're here and we'll be sure to interact with you there. 
Now I want everyone to go ahead and mark your calendars for August 19th to the 21st because Revival Weekend is happening. And so this is a three-day event that takes place right here at our Lee Summit campus. And there's so many awesome things that are gonna happen that weekend. And so we're gonna have biblical teaching, worship, baptisms, family fun fest, so many cool things. And you're gonna wanna be a part of it. And so go to livingproof.co slash revival to sign up. We're gonna be pushing out a lot of resources over the next couple of weeks to you guys so that you can be best prepared for that weekend. And so you're gonna wanna be sure to sign up. Now we're gonna move in to a time of giving. And this time is specifically for those of y'all that call Abundant Life your church home and your church family. And we're so thankful to be a part of such a generous church. And because y'all continue to be generous, not only are we able to serve the people here in our city, but people all across the world. And so thank y'all so much. As we continue in our worship service, we just wanna give y'all a couple of ways to give. You can text to give, give online, and give using the envelope in the seat back in front of you. Thank you all so much for joining us for church this morning. We love you guys. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we love you so much. God, we're so honored and humbled to sit in this place, your body of believers, to worship you. God, I thank you for the freedom that you've given us on the cross so that we can walk in a relationship with you, so that we can know you and make you known. Um, Lord, and as we're sitting in this weekend just celebrating the freedoms that we have, God, we also just wanna celebrate um, and thank you for what you've done for us so that we can have freedom in Christ too. And so, God, we love you. We give you glory and honor for what happens in this house today. In your name we pray, amen. Church, so good to see you once again. We're in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 8 is where we're going to be. If this is your first time, we're going verse by verse, line by line, through the book of Daniel. We're living at a time that is truly prophetic and completely historic. Days, I'm convinced, Daniel saw 2,500 years B.C. as a Hebrew prophet. And God showed him a vision of the time of the end in Daniel chapter 8. Got so much to say and so little time, so let's get going. You ready for this? Say yes. All right, here we go. Listen, I want to remind you, there's so much going on in the book of Daniel. Don't have time to do it all on Sunday morning. I've been releasing these extra edition lessons. If you really want to keep peeling back the layers, tune in tomorrow to another lesson in Daniel chapter 8. It's entitled, The Rapture of the Church and the Reign of Terror. One of the number one questions I get is about the rapture, the next prophetic event on God's timeline of prophetic events is something we call the rapture of the church. And of course, people want to know, is it pre-trib, before the seven-year tribulation? Is it mid-trib in the middle of the tribulation? Is it post-trib at the end of the tribulation? That's kind of the in-house debate. Theologically, I'll give you five reasons why I'm convinced it's a pre-tribulational rapture that Jesus comes for his bride before the seven-year tribulation begins. It's Described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, there's coming a day. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall be forevermore with the Lord. Paul said, therefore comfort one another with these words. There is coming a day that Jesus is coming for his bride, the church. And we ought to take comfort in those words. There is a generation of Christians that will never feel the sting of death. They will be alive at the rapture of the church and instantly caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. How many of you think tomorrow morning would be a really great time for that to happen? Yes? Amen? Man, I tell you, I remember as a, as a little guy growing up in church in the 1970s, you heard a lot about the rapture. And at the time, you know, the worst thing was getting left behind. You remember this in the distant trumpet and some of these, you know, movies that came out that scared a lot of kids into heaven because they didn't want to go to hell? Remember some of those movies? Like, I mean, I don't, but, but here's the reality. I remember at the time going, man, I don't want the rapture to come. I want, I want Jesus to come someday, not yet. I want to live my life. I got a life I want to live. I'm just saying if you're a young person today and the idea of Christ's return is not that appealing because you're young and you got your whole life ahead of you, I'm just telling you, one, you'll get over that. 
In about 30 years, you'll be over that. <laughs> and you'll realize nothing could be better than Jesus coming today. If you look around, your heart is troubled. Here's what Jesus said in John 14. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself to where I am, there you may be also. You say, Phil, how can you be so certain that Jesus Christ is coming again? Because I can look behind me in history and I can see prophecy after prophecy that was made about his first coming, the first coming of the Messiah, and Jesus fulfilled every single one. What do you think that means for the prophecies that yet remain for his second coming? I like my odds. I like my odds. I'm gonna stick with the Bible. This is why we're studying prophecy in Daniel chapter eight and beyond, because it ought to give us a sense of urgency to live for the things of eternity with a kingdom priority. Uh, it gives us a sense of understanding the world that is. You can't be effective for God in a world that you don't understand. And yet we're seeing a world that is emerging very much like what the prophets foretold and Jesus foretold. Daniel chapter eight is where we are this morning. October the 24th, 1945, the United Nations was chartered. And on that date, October the 24th, 1945, it seemed like a very novel idea as the nations came together to unite. They'd just been torn to shreds by a, a global war, a, a world war. And as the United Nations was chartered, the nations of the earth had come together to say never again, and they dreamed of a global community, a global society where there was shared prosperity and mutual generosity and this great global community. In fact, they were so certain that they could usher in world peace and prosperity and plenty for everybody. They actually had the words of Isaiah chapter two enshrined and carved into the wall of the UN building in New York City. You can go there today and you can see these words carved into the wall of the UN. Isaiah 2 and verse 4, written 2,700 years ago by the Hebrew prophet Isaiah. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. They were so certain that they could end war forever. They actually had these words carved into the walls of the UN building. And I want you to notice the dream is not wrong. The vision isn't wrong. The problem for the UN and the problem for all the kingdoms of men is that the kings of men cannot usher in the promises of God. And we're trying to usher in the promises of God with the kingdom of men. And the kingdom of men will always end in disaster and destruction. That is the theme you see of the book of Daniel. Only the kingdom of our God will last forever. And I want you to know that this is the right dream. The idea that we could end war, the earth's golden age, and, and a global community, a global society of shared prosperity and mutual generosity. It, it's, it's not the wrong dream. It's the right dream. The, the problem is men can never do what only God has promised to do do. You see, this has been the plan of God since he put Adam in a garden and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The plan has always been an earthly kingdom where the nations of the earth are under God's authority and the nations of the earth are coming together in this global community united under God's authority of unity, peace, and prosperity. And the Hebrew prophets saw this. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts are upon him. You see, the Hebrew prophet saw the Messiah, the anointed one, God's son, the Savior King, that will one day come and usher in this kingdom that would be without end. 
I want you to see the vision and the dream of these great social reformers and these global reformers is not the wrong dream. The problem is we cannot have world peace until the Prince of Peace actually comes. Which is why in the years since October the 24th, 1945, we don't seem any closer to ushering in world peace because the kingdom of men cannot usher in the promises of God. You see, we live in a world at war. It is at war with itself. We live in a creation at war, at war with itself. You see, the Bible is a book about kings and kingdoms. It's a book about a collision of kingdoms, a war for the world. You see, Satan's desire has always been, since the moment of insurrection, to sit on the throne of God and be worshiped as God and establish his kingdom instead of God. I don't know if you realize this or not, but the first ever summit of the United Nations was not October the 24th, 1945. It was actually about 2,300 years B.C. as another king, a man known in history as Nimrod, whose name means Lord of Rebellion, said to the nations, come now, let us build a city and a tower that will reach into heaven. That sounds a lot like another Nimrod the true Nimrod, the true Lord of Rebellion, whose name is Satan, he said something very similar in Isaiah 14, verse 13, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And I want you to notice that is why one Nimrod after another, after another, after another. By the way, there's a reason no little baby boys are being named Nimrod. A lot of good Bible names, that's not one of them. You little rebel, that's what the name means. But yet one Nimrod after another, since the original Nimrod has attempted to do what? Conquer the world and rule the world. And it always ends in destruction. The kingdom of men cannot usher in the promises of God. Yet the Bible prophesies it's gonna happen one more time. There will be a new world order. And that is in fact the phrase you hear over and over again. It's a modern vernacular, a new world order. And you know, Daniel chapter 8 tells us who this next world king will be. Daniel chapter 8 describes the Antichrist who will reign as Satan's counterfeit king over an earthly kingdom shortly before the second coming of Christ. You see, for Satan to have what he's always wanted, an earthly kingdom to sit on the throne of God and be worshiped as God, he must unite the nations. What is the vision of the United Nations? It's to unite the nations. And did you know at this very hour, people who don't even believe the Bible and certainly don't believe biblical prophecy, they themselves are laying the foundation to fulfill biblical prophecy. I just love that. God uses unbelievers to fulfill what the Bible says is going to happen, and we're watching it happen in our age, in our day. And the Bible tells us one day there will once again be a new world order, a global society in the last days, shortly before the second coming of Christ. And Daniel chapter eight tells us about this last king the Bible calls the Antichrist. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and I preached two messages in a studio, not on Sunday morning. I really encourage you to watch those two. One we released last week, and release another one tomorrow. What we learn in Daniel chapter 8 is this prophecy is about three kings. Listen carefully. Two of which have come and gone, one of which remains yet future. Daniel chapter 8 prophesies two kings that would come from Greece as prophetic forerunners of this last king that is still yet future. 200 years before Alexander the Great was even born, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel prophesies the coming of Alexander the Great that would establish the Grecian kingdom. You've heard of Alexander the Great. The other king is Antiochus Epiphanes. He's lesser known in history, but no less significant. Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, both Grecian kings, prophetic forerunners of this last king, this third king. I want you to notice two-thirds of this prophecy has been fulfilled. Two of these kings have come and gone. People say, well, the Antichrist, that's just a symbol of evil. That's just allegorical. Wait a minute. Was Alexander the Great allegorical or was he literal? was Antiochus Epiphanes, a real man in history that we should take literally. The answer is class, 
What do you think it says about this last king that remains? Oh, he's just symbolic. Now, wait a minute. If the first two kings were literal, I suggest we take the last part of this prophecy literally too. There's another king that remains. We're about to learn more about him today. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Gabriel, an angel, a messenger angel, one of those powerful angels in the heavenly host. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. He's saying, Daniel, what you're about to see, what I'm about to tell you is not for your time, it's for the time of the end of which I'm convinced we're now living. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features who understand sinister schemes. I want you to notice something. The world is even now awaiting just this kind of a king. This is the word of Chuck Hagel. This is something Chuck Hagel said. The former defense secretary who served under the Obama administration, the world is experiencing historic defining times that result in a new world order. This is a time of global transformation. We are essentially seeing a new world order evolving and being built. I don't think we've seen such a time since right after World War II. Now, I share this with you because there's a lot of people that think, well, you know, you guys believe in this new world order. This is just some right-wing conspiracy theory. I'm talking, you know, just, you know, a bunch of Bible thumpers, a bunch of backwoods crazy people. No, wait a minute. This concept of a new world order was not invented by right wing conspiracy theorists. And I would suggest that you stay off QAnon and all the other conspiracy rumor mill gossip on the internet. Let's just deal in known facts. Here are the facts. The first time this term was ever used that I'm aware of came from a U.S. president by the name of George H.W. Bush on the outset of the Persian Gulf War in 1989, where he referred to a new world order. That same term was used by the Clinton administration, Bill Clinton. It's been used by every presidential administration since. A new world order. These men and women are not Bible believers and certainly not right-wingers. Chuck Hagel would be anything but a right-wing conspiracy theorist. So when I refer to this new world order, I'm not dealing with conspiracy. I'm dealing with true biblical prophecy of which we can see the props and the players being positioned on the platform for exactly what God told us would happen at the time of the end. And even unbelieving men like Chuck Hagel that certainly doesn't believe the Bible, he certainly wouldn't be a right winger himself, understands that we are watching a global transformation, a new world order where there's increasing movement and vision to unite the nations. And the Bible tells us there's gonna be a leader who one day emerges that does just that unites the nations. What happened in the days of Babel, Genesis chapter 11? Let us build a city and a tower that will reach into heaven. The world was united by a common language and collective knowledge, and all they needed was a common leader. What is the world situation today geopolitically? We want to again have a common language. You understand? That's what computers have done. It has united the world. I mean, 20 years ago, they called it the information superhighway. You say, Phil, that's so archaic. We don't call the internet that today. Well, then it became the World Wide Web. I don't know if they still call it that today. The point is, it's united the world. What do computers speak? They speak languages. What do computer programmers write? They write languages. Do you understand? We are right back at the Tower of Babel. Do you understand that today there is a collective knowledge and a collective language? All that is left is a collective world leader. You're right back in Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel. Babel means gate to God. The kingdom of men is the deification of man. We can usher in our own kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, but it will end like all the others in destruction. I want to see four things today about this future world leader. 
typified and prophetically foreshadowed by Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, what we learned in Daniel 8, is he will rise to power with the speed of Alexander the Great, and he'll reign with the cruelty of this one in history known as Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, that doesn't make any sense to you if you haven't seen one of those lessons that we put on that I did in a studio. As we studied the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes, this man in history specifically, that ushered in a brutal holocaust upon the Jews in 167 BC. What we learn about this future king, number one, is he will deceive many. He will deceive many. This is an age of deception. We're living at an age of distortion. And if you're not tied to the Bible, I'm talking God's written revelation, you will be easily deceived by what you see. Verse 23, in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features who understand sinister schemes. Verse 25, through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. So he'll be a very deceptive leader. He will deceive masses of humanity into following his leadership globally. Listen carefully. What would it take for the nations of the world to sacrifice autonomy and national sovereignty to unite globally? I mean, think about what we're witnessing. Think about what we're watching. What would happen and what would it take for the nations of the earth to say, okay, it's time to hit the great reset, and that is the term national leaders and Heads of state are using all over the world today the reset, a reset of the world systems. What would it take for the nations to finally lay down some national sovereignty and autonomy to come under one global governance? I would suggest the promise of financial stability, shared prosperity, peace, and security. We are probably one global crisis, one global event away from this happening already. I've said many times that COVID was a significant event that's gonna lead to a series of significant events that leads to eventually the main event. See, prophecy is never fulfilled in a single day. It's, It's fulfilled gradually, sometimes subtly, over a series of events that leads then to the main event. You think about our situation in our world today, this global crisis, this global pandemic, and what it has done to the world platform geopolitically. What would cause the nations of the earth to do this? I'm talking global economic cataclysm. Economic Armageddon where the current world system implodes and from the ashes there is a reset of the world system. And in some way we're already watching this happen. By the way, we are a nation, 30 trillion dollars in debt. Our national debt has doubled in the last decade. 30 trillion dollars in debt. The dollar today is worth 60% of what it was 20 years ago. Our our, our government has printed $6 trillion in the last two years. I don't know if you understand if, if, if you understand what that does to a currency, but, but that is what causes inflation. Inflation is at 8.6%. It's, it's not a mystery as to how we got here. When you print $6 trillion, of monopoly money and you flood an economy with, this is what happens. This is how, this is how inflation happens, by the way. That's the, the black horse rider of Revelation chapter six. Economic recession, global economic depression, runaway inflation, that's exactly what is prophesied. I would suggest the four horsemen of the apocalypse are out of the barn. I'm not trying to scare you, I'm trying to prepare you. As a child of God, you got nothing to be scared of. We're on the winning side. Keep telling yourself, remind yourself that. I know how it ends in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. It'll be okay in the end. Just want you to see the world platform is being prepared. There's only one economy now that stands in the way of a global economy. 
The economies of the earth are already linked together, intricately linked together. There's only one economy in the world that holds all the others up. Guess what? It's the U.S. economy. If the U.S. economy should suddenly implode, all the other world economies go down with it. There's only one currency that is currently holding up all the other world currencies. Guess what it is? It's the dollar. It's been devalued by 60% in the last 20 years. What do you think this means? We're watching the collapse of a nation. $30 $30 trillion in debt. There's a payday someday. How long they can float it? I don't know. I don't know that anybody does. I just know eventually there's a payday someday. There's a reset happening. One global crisis probably away from it happening already. The world economy fragile as fine China. The promise of financial stability, shared prosperity, peace, and security. The World Economic Forum, one of the most powerful, influential organizations in the history of humanity, certainly in the last century. Klaus Schwab, a German engineer and billionaire businessman, founds the World Economic Federation the World Economic Forum in 1971. They met in Davos, Switzerland every year since. In 2020, they themed their gathering as the reset. This is what he said in 2020 in front of 2,500 global leaders, business leaders, heads of state, billionaires, leaders in every industry, journalism, media. This is the World Economic Forum, all of which believe in a global governance, a global vision. He said these words, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. And since that day in 2020, this is the term that many heads of state have used, the the great reset. And that the pandemic has given us the chance to accelerate this world vision. He would go on to write a book recently released entitled COVID-19, The Great Reset. I want you to see this is not conspiracy. This is not being done done in secrecy. This is being done wide open for anybody paying attention. It's exactly as the Bible tells us it will happen. The time of the end, there is a new world order coming. He wrote this in his book, COVID-19, The Great Reset. The more nationalism and isolationism pervade the global polity, the greater the chance that global governance loses its relevance and becomes ineffective. Sadly, we're now at this critical juncture. Put bluntly, we live in a world in which nobody is really in charge. You hear what he's saying? He says somebody needs to be in charge of the world. And part of the problem is we live in a world where nobody's actually in charge. Nobody there has the authority to make the nations all play well together in the same sandbox. Right there's the problem. That's what he believes. That's what he's saying. Now he goes on, he says this, COVID-19 has reminded us that the biggest problems we face are global in nature whose risk can only be mitigated in a collective fashion. I think we would all agree that the nations in cooperation, collective fashion, is the way we ought to address the global crisis we face, of which there are several, undoubtedly. But I would also suggest that when you look behind you in history, and the best predictor of the future is always the past, anytime power is centralized in the hands of too few, it never ends well for the rest. Just ask the 20 million Russians that died under Joseph Stalin, or perhaps the 100 million Chinese under Mao Zedong. Oh, that was the People's Revolution. Yeah, 100 million of them died. You see, we think somehow this new world order is going to be unlike the last ones. This is what he's arguing for. It's a day of deception. And this is where you see the infamous mark of the beast come into play. In Revelation chapter 13, the infamous mark of the beast. Revelation 13 tells us the world will be united economically, politically, and even religiously into a global community under the Antichrist authority. What is this infamous mark of the beast? Now get out of your mind's eye everything you've ever pictured about the Antichrist. He will not be scary. I mean, sometimes we picture the Antichrist with 666 tattooed on his forehead. All right, get that out of your mind's eye. We think the Antichrist, you know, has got horns and a pitchfork. (laughs) 
I should have been in movies. I'd have been a good bad guy. Missed my calling. No, I'm trying to, t- the Antichrist is not going to be scary. He's, he, you're not going to, oh, that's the Antichrist. No, he is a man. He will be a political leader full of charisma, full of compassion. He will appear to have all the answers to the world's hardest problems. What is the mark of the beast? I will promise nobody at the time that's here is going to think to themselves, oh, I'm going to sell my soul to the devil. No, that's not how it's going to happen. The mark of the beast technology, I remember in Revelation 13, John is using the limits of a first century language to describe things for which words have not yet been invented. What you have is a global banking system. If you don't have this mark, you won't be able to buy, sell, or trade. You're completely locked out of commerce. Not only that, it's a global tracking system. If you're not worshiping the image of the beast, they will know that you weren't there. How will they know? Because it's GPS. And it's going to make perfect sense Imagine your credit cards, your debit cards, never again being lost or stolen. Never again do you have to worry about your ID being stolen in one place, in one space, in a microchip. You have your personal ID, your passport, your COVID-19 vaccination, proof of record, or whatever the next pandemic is that will preclude this. Your banking system is on there. Think about this, in a world full of insecurity, your children can never again be lost or stolen. They can't be kidnapped because they can be tracked now within 10 feet of their location within 10 minutes. It's gonna make perfect sense. Your teenagers can never again lie about where they were on Saturday night, two o'clock in the morning. Mom, Dad, I'm serious, I was at youth group. We're having a Bible study. And now as a parent, you go, oh no, you weren't. I know where you were. The novel Brave New World, written in 1932. The novel 1984, published in 1949. Do you understand the 20th century science fiction authors saw the world we are now living only today? It's not science fiction, it's science. They were fiction writers. This is not nonfiction. Meet Joan Osterland, he's Swedish. He's founder of a Swedish company called Biohacks. They produce microchips, not for cars, but for people. And in the last two years, thousands and thousands of Swedes have been fitted with this microchip right here on their right hand, just above their thumb. By the way, you never have to worry about losing your keys. Your key's right there with a swipe of the hand. You can get into your house and get into your car. With a swipe of the hand, you have your, your debit card right there. With a swipe of the hand, you have all your medical information. It's right there. Guys, this is not science fiction. This is happening in real time. Now, this is not the mark of the beast, but it is absolutely, undoubtedly, the technology that will be used when a global crisis ushers in a global government that says you have to have this chip or you will be locked out of global society. You will not be able to participate in any commercially buying or selling gas, groceries, nothing. Here's what Klaus Schwab wrote in his book, COVID-19, The Great Reset, about this technology. We will see how contact tracing has an unequaled capacity and quasi-essential place in the armory needed to combat COVID-19. You understand, you carry this technology around with you right now, every day, in your pocket or in your purse. It's called your smartphone. You already have it on your body, and it's already tracking your movements. It knows exactly where you're going. By the way, it knows exactly who you've been near in the last 24 hours because your phones talk to each other. Contact tracing, your phone knows who you've been near. You've been near somebody with COVID-19, now the World Health Organization is gonna know. By the way, in May, our federal government 
went to the WHO forum that happened to be also in Switzerland at the very same time the World Economic Forum was meeting, and our government suggested 13 amendments to the WHO constitution that would have suggested the WHO has complete sovereignty over all the nations during another global health crisis. That's how nations eventually will give away sovereignty. Now, because of the outcry, not just from the U.S., but other nations, it didn't happen. But it was actually suggested that in the next global health crisis, the WHO gets sovereignty over the nation's health response. In all probability, this is how it's going to happen. This is what Klaus Schwab was suggesting. Now, look at what he says next about this. Well, at the same time, being positioned to become an enabler of mass surveillance. This is happening in real time by people who don't believe the Bible. They just unwittingly are fulfilling biblical prophecy. An age of deception, he'll be a great deceiver, but number two, he will claim not only to be a deceiver, he will be a deceiver and deceive many, but he'll also claim to be deity. Look at verse 25, through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart, he shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, the Lord Jesus Christ, but he shall be broken without human means. Now this is exactly what the apostle Paul saw in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse three, let no one deceive you by any means, that day, the second coming, will not come unless the falling away comes first, of which we're now living, and the great falling away, the word is apostia, from which we get the word apostasy, the apostate church is emerging in our day. And look what he says next, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Jesus called this in Matthew 24, the abomination of desolation. At the midway through the tribulation, he breaks the peace treaty, Daniel 9, 27, of which I'm preaching about next week. That begins the seven-year countdown toward Armageddon as he brokers peace and the Middle East, halfway through, he breaks the peace treaty with the Jews. He goes into the rebuilt temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. We know Revelation 13 says he receives a mortal head wound. He is assassinated. The false prophet, the religious leader, raises up an image of the beast, and that image, the icon is the Greek word, is what is actually worshiped. He sits in the temple of God claiming to be God. Do you understand at this point you have Satan incarnate? Satan now possesses the body of a man sitting in the temple of God on the throne of God where he is worshiped as God. He has counterfeited even the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's a great counterfeiter. He counterfeits even the resurrection of Jesus, and this is the point where he begins to be worshiped, not simply as a great political leader that united the nations, But now in front of a watching world, it appears he's resurrected. Now they worship him as deity. He will prove he is deity by performing supernatural miracles, lying signs and wonders. Paul said this to the Thessalonians, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. He has supernatural power. He can do miracles. Why did Jesus do miracles? To prove he is God, that he is more than merely a man. Why will this man do miracles? To prove that he is God. He is empowered by Satan. I've said before, if you want to see a sign and you want to see a wonder, be careful. Satan can do those too. Oh, he'll deceive many into worshiping him as deity, but he'll destroy with tyranny. He will destroy with cruelty. Jesus said a holocaust in Matthew 24, unlike the world has ever seen or will ever see again. 
Daniel 8, 24, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. There will be scores of people in the tribulation who receive the true and living Christ. They reject the mark of the beast. They reject the antichrist. It'll be worldwide revival. Revelation 7, beginning with 144,000 Jews. Revival in Israel. They go forth preaching the gospel among the nations. At the end of Revelation 7, and John sees every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. Millions of people coming to faith in Christ, and they will pay a high price. They'll be considered enemies of the state. For the same reason the early Christians were martyred, they refused to worship Caesar. You have history repeating itself. And this revived Roman Empire, the rebirth of this Roman emperor that's been deified. The true followers of Jesus Christ would rather die for the truth than live for a lie. And Jesus promised in this bloody reign of terror, shortly before he comes again, Many will pay a high price. They will die for the truth, refusing to live for a lie. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He rises to power, promising peace and security, but then subdues the nations through tyranny and brutality. This is the red horse the third horse of the four horsemen of Revelation 6. When he opens the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. He rises to power under the banner of peace. He brokers peace in the Middle East. He comes on a white horse. Historically, in the ancient days, a conquering king rode a white horse. The white horse was reserved for a conquering general, but he has a bow but no arrows. He, he comes to power without firing a shot. But quickly, he will wage all-out war. Number four, the good news, he loses You lose, he will be deposed quickly. Verse 25, he shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. Now, not by the hand of man. No, he's far too powerful to be defeated by the hand of man. Without human means, at his second coming, the Lord Jesus Christ will depose and destroy the Antichrist. The apostle Paul saw this moment, and he wrote about it in his letter to the Thessalonians. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. When Jesus returns with nothing more than the breath of his mouth, he will incinerate instantly depose this counterfeit king that reigned over this new world order, this counterfeit kingdom. In the end, righteousness will absolutely win. Verse 26, in the vision in the evening and mornings, which was told is true, therefore seal up the vision. God tells Daniel, seal this vision up. It's not for now, it's for the time of the end. For it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Yeah, you would have too. This was a nightmare, but it was more than a bad dream. Daniel realized this is real. <laughs> he fainted. He was sick for days. Let me ask you, are you ever sick when you see the condition of our world? Man, it makes me sick. Enough to make you want to faint, not get out of bed. That's how Daniel felt for days. Look at what it says, though. Afterward, I arose. It is time for the people of God to rise up. It is time for a rising of the remnant. It is time to get up, rise up. Daniel said, afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. 
Listen, this is not the time to pull the electric blanket over our head and just wait for Jesus to come back and save us. It is time to rise up and get about the king's business. Jesus said, occupy till I come. And that's exactly what we're going to continue to do. We must be about the king's business to advance the kingdom and prepare to see the king. And at this very hour, you're already in one of two world orders. You are now at this hour in one of two kingdoms. You're either in the kingdom of men, which will end in destruction, or you're a member of the kingdom of God. And if indeed you're a member of God's kingdom, then it's time to Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God. Above all else, seek first the kingdom of God. And we can begin to see, quite frankly, these two kingdoms widening. Guys, it was seen recently with the reversal of Roe v. Wade. If you're a member of the kingdom of God, it ought to cause you celebration. Because I'm telling you, if you're a Christian, there is only one position. Unless you're thinking politically, unless you're thinking emotionally, there's only one position if you're thinking biblically. Life supersedes every other right. What do women give birth to? Aardvarks? This one's simple. This, this is easy. We live in a world of complexities, I understand, but this one's not complex. No, the reality, if women gave birth to sea turtles, they would have had more protection in the last 50 years than babies. Now, here's the reality, guys. Uh, unsaved people will do unsaved things. Ungodly people will think ungodly things. What, what gives me alarm are people who claim to be Christians, members of God's kingdom. but want to take me to task on social media because I quote the Bible and say, hey, praise God. Now, I, I don't care if you can take me to task. Honestly, I, I'm not offended. It's okay, I'm not mad at you even if you're mad at me. I have an ancient Hebrew idiom to tell you how I feel about it. Jimmy Crack Corn, I don't care. <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you, kingdom of God, kingdom of men. You're in one of two world orders now, and your worldview defines your world order, how you view the world. I'm coming down on the side of God's kingdom every single time. It is the only one that's gonna last forever, and we should celebrate the reversal of Roe v. Wade. But let's get straight, this isn't revival. It's not revival. We need to pray for revival. Hearts must change, and only God can change the hearts of wicked men and women. So to prepare for our revival weekend coming up in August, we're going to have 40 days of prayer. And I want you to text right now, sometime today, REVIVAL68618. Starting July 11th, we're going to have 40 days of prayer. You're going to get a prayer prompt once a day as we begin to pray in unity as a church family every day in exactly the same way. God in heaven, I pray for revival in our day, that the move of God would be indescribable, undeniable. Heaven sent upon the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the church, upon this land, that we would be more than sick when we look at the condition of our world, but it would make us rise up as Daniel rose up to do the king's business, to serve an earthly king. Lord, that we would rise up to serve a heavenly king, the king of heaven. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you give Jesus the glory with me today? Praise him, would you? Church, I love you very much. Well, Abundant Life Online, happy 4th of July once again. Let's grab those fireworks, get with friends and family, and celebrate 
Independence Day tomorrow. And if you're actually not in America, well, go grab a firework, go grab some snacks, go grab some fans and family, and let's just celebrate together that though we might be celebrating here in this country the 4th of July, we can always celebrate what God's done to unify us across the world under one kingdom, one country of God. Also, if you are looking to take your next steps in abundant life, or maybe you want to take your next steps in following Jesus, would you go to livingproof.co slash next steps and let us know how we can help. We would love to walk with you as you start taking your next steps in abundant life. And also if you start taking your next steps with Jesus. Well, I have an incredible story about a lady that took her next steps. She actually was in the next steps class and she started following Jesus. But this week, my wife and I went to her apartment, filled up her bathtub, and baptize her right there in her apartment. Her name is Sandra. Sandra, if you're at this service, would you let us know by putting in the chat? We just wanna celebrate you and your life change through Jesus. We love seeing lives being changed by Jesus. Well, I wanna invite you to two specific things. One, if you haven't heard yet, August 19th through the 21st, we're gonna be coming right here to Lee Summit and we're gonna be celebrating Revival Weekend. It's kind of like, our family reunion across Abundant Life. So please, please, please go to livingproof.co revival, grab your tickets, register, let us know you're coming because we want to celebrate with you. And lastly, if you are looking for community, just connect with others. We just launched a thing we call connect groups right here on the online campus where people can connect with people across the world, build friendships in the hopes that potentially they could build smaller communities where they really know each other. So a connect group really simply is a place for you to connect with others and get to know one another. If you're interested in that, go to livingproof.co slash online and click on that online groups button and register for connect groups. Well, church, I love you. Happy 4th of July if you're here in America. We'll see you next week.